Diuretics are considered cardiac drugs. Their goal is to reduce the total blood volume. This is going to cause a decrease in the venous pressure and in the afterload, so the heart is working less to be able to pump the same amount of blood out. It will decrease symptoms such as pulmonary edema, which causes shortness of breath, orthopnea, PND, or peripheral edema. And it can decrease the amount of cardiac dilation because the more volume you have pressing on the heart, the more that muscle will stretch. So once again, symptomatic reduction in heart failure. Now the problem is that because these are powerful drugs decreasing the blood volume, you may cause hypotension, a low circulating blood volume, and because of that, your cardiac output and blood pressure are low enough that you're not going to get enough blood to the tissues. So it's a balance between too much circulating blood and not enough. However, most of these do not prolong the survival. They only provide that symptomatic relief. The first set of drugs in this diuretic category is the loop diuretics, and they are called this because they act in the loop of Henle, and I want you to remember furosemide because it's the most frequently prescribed. It's going to block sodium, chloride, and potassium from reabsorbing, so you're going to lose most of your electrolytes this way. The benefit of these drugs is that they are very powerful. You'll have profound diuresis and a risk for hypotension, which is the black box warning. That being said, we use these in severe situations, such as a congestive heart failure exacerbation or with severe edema when they're not responding to other drugs and we need to rapidly remove that fluid. The most important side effect to remember is hypokalemia because there are several diuretics that can actually preserve potassium. This is not one of them. If you're asked a question about what electrolytes you use in most circumstances, you're going to decrease all electrolytes. The two things that will increase is glucose, you'll have hyperglycemia, and hyperuricemia. So individuals with gout or diabetes, we need to watch them carefully. Now, additionally, these drugs are ototoxic, but that is reversible. So we don't like to pair them with other ototoxic drugs at the same time. A beneficial interaction is combining it with a potassium sparing diuretic, so you don't get this side effect of hypokalemia. Additionally, we don't want to use too many antihypertensive agents together because we'll decrease the blood pressure too far. So you have to slowly increase the number of drugs or the type of drugs or the dose of drugs on these antihypertensive agents to be careful. For absorption PKPD information, Note that these can work within 30 minutes, which is really important for those that are at risk of exacerbation or currently undergoing one. These are also effective in those with renal impairment, even if their GFR is low. Thiazide diuretics are actually similar. They work at the distal convoluted tubule. They're going to have a lot of the same effects, but only 10% is filtered at this site, so they're going to be a lot less profound and powerful. The good news about that is that they're going to be your first-line drug of choice for hypertension. They're your mild diuretic that we can use. They'll have about the same side effects because they're doing virtually the same thing, blocking sodium, chloride, and potassium. However, they'll have no ototoxicity. Finally, the contraindications for these drugs are those with a decreased GFR. Like I said, loop diuretics can be used in renal impairment, but you must avoid them in those with a low GFR because they become ineffective. The diuresis is within two hours, which is significantly different from that 30 minutes that you're going to be using the loop diuretics. Now, this last set of drugs is the potassium sparing diuretics, and these are often very ineffective on their own, but when you combine them with thiazides or loop diuretics, they can mitigate the side effect of hypokalemia. They act in the distal nephron, and they're going to be used in hypertension and edema. Now, there's two types, an aldosterone antagonist and a non-aldosterone antagonist. And you'll see aldosterone antagonists in another section as well, but remember spironolactone because it actually does reduce mortality and readmissions for those with heart failure.
From here, it's going to block aldosterone for the mechanism of action, which will cause this retention of potassium, but an increased excretion of the sodium. So we can continue to diurese these individuals because water will follow sodium. The special use for these is PCOS because of the aldosterone effects. But as a result, you may overcorrect. So you're going to see endocrine side effects, including gynecomastia, menstrual irregularities, and even hirsutism. There's an interesting black box warning here, which is that it can cause tumors. They've only seen that in rats, and it's not really something that we worry about, but just be aware of it. Now, these drugs are actually going to be part of the RAS system, and there's another video where we'll talk about the RAS drugs, but you want to avoid using them in combination, as well as other drugs that increase the potassium levels, because that's their main goal, is to maintain the potassium levels. For these, they take a while to develop, 48 hours. So we're not going to use these in acute situations. This is for long-term control. There are other potassium-sparing diuretics called non-aldosterone antagonists. This is triamterine and amylaride. And they're going to directly inhibit the exchange mechanism as opposed to blocking the synthesis of new proteins in the aldosterone antagonists. These have mild effects, um, mostly related to hyperkalemia, but the black box warning is that fatal hyperkalemia where it starts to cause arrhythmias in the heart. The final drug that you won't talk much about in this class is an osmotic drug called mannitol, and it's used to have profound diuresis in times of increased intracranial pressure.